we're going to be talking about steamships today and the ships that were traveling on the route from Boston to Bangor. Uh, in 1834, regular steamship service began and they went uh, up along the coast uh, from Boston to Portland and then up to Penobscot Bay and then up Penobscot River. And you can see in this painting here, this is uh, right near our museum here in town in Searsport. There's a group of people collected along the wharf. There's a steamship coming in to pick them up and drop off some other people. And we're going to be looking at some paintings today of the ships that traveled this route. We'll be able to see some changes in the mechanics and in the aesthetics of these ships. This is the Eastern Steamship Company. It was a conglomeration of several smaller companies. And you can see their uh, brochure here to advertise the steamship line. Thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, despite technical difficulties today, and we're really happy to have you here. And this is a map of the route. And if you can see down at the bottom here, near Thomaston, are a number of islands and ledges. That's going to come up again later. Uh, Rockland here, Belfast, um, Camden, Belfast, Searsport where we are right here. Uh, so you can see the, here's the route, Rockland, Camden, Northport, Belfast, Searsport, Bucksport, Winterport, Hamden, and Bangor. And then there was another route that also went to other islands in Penobscot Bay, uh, like Mount Desert Island, um, Castine, places like that. So there are advantages of steam over sail, and um, the obvious one is that the steamship can keep going no matter what the wind is doing. So if there's contrary winds, a uh, sailing ship is going to have to go tacking uh, back and forth, side to side, takes a lot longer. Or if there's no wind at all, a sailing ship can't go anywhere, whereas a steamship can. Um, thanks so much again for joining us today. Penobscot Marine Museum. We're talking about steamships that went from Boston to Bangor. So you can see why people would be interested in exploring some alternatives to sail. Um, but early steamships had a number of limitations. One of the limitations was fuel. Wood fuel took up a lot of space on the ship and carrying a large stockpiles of wood it wasn't practical. Um, it meant that steamships were more adaptable for short routes, routes where you could frequently stop and refuel. So it works well along the river or along a coast with a lot of cities. Now, in, when they shifted to coal, burning coal in the steamships, that helped because coal gets you more energy for the amount of space it takes up in the hold, but still somewhat limited. Uh, in the beginning, there were a lot of instances of engines failing, um, so steamships also had masts so that they could still keep going um, even when the engine failed. And you can see that right here in the John Brooks steamship. We have two masts and uh, they're schooner rigged. They have uh, one each mast has a schooner sail on it, or a four and a half sail. The John Brooks was built in New York. It was 250 feet long and carried 1,000 tons. In the Civil War, it served as Union troop transport. It was purchased by the Portland Steam Packet um, so, and then it started doing a Boston to Portland service and the 
Portland Steam Packet was one of those smaller companies that uh, was subsumed into the Eastern Steamship Company in 1901. In 1887, uh, the John Brooks started doing the route from Boston to Castine, Southwest Harbor, uh, Bar Harbor, um, and uh, Machias, Machias Port. By 1899, it was too old, um, and so it was dismantled. Um, but this is a really cool picture here. You can see the huge paddles, uh, one on each side, a big, huge wheel with many paddles. And it's connected to the engine. So the engine is in the center and there's a furnace inside. And so there's some guys there shoving fuel into the furnace and that's heating up the water that creates the steam and the steam pushes this piston up and down, the pressure of the steam. This beam here, or walking beam, is uh, like a seesaw. So when this piston goes up and down, the piston on the other side, or the, the rod on the other side, goes down and up, opposite from the piston. And that is what pushes this wheel round and round. And that's what makes it go. Thanks again so much for finding us here today, despite all of our technical difficulties. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. I'm Sarah from Penobscot Marine Museum, and we're looking at steamships. And if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and type them into the comment into the chat box. Thank you. We love questions. We love hearing from you. Any questions or comments are fun. This is the Penobscot. So this is a print by Courier and Ives of a later steamship. It was built in 1882 in East Boston. At the time, it was the biggest ship on the Bangor to Boston line. It also was the first one on that line to have electric lights. It was 255 feet long and 1,400 tons. And once again, you can see there's a huge uh, paddle wheel, one on each side, and in the center is the engine. And you can see that same walking beam, same kind of mechanism as in the John Brooks. But the Penobscot is a little bit bigger and fancier. Uh, you can see lots of passengers gathered uh, on the decks. There were a lot of large fancy cabins and then there were also a bunch of smaller cabins with a price difference, I'm sure. You can see the passengers in their uh, coats and hats here. So the Penobscot, did the Boston Bangor route for about 20 years, then it was sold to New York, uh, where it started traveling up and down the Hudson. And that's where the Penobscot ran aground uh, one night in 1911. It got really firmly stuck in a bed of clay for an entire month. They couldn't get it out. They had to dredge both sides. They placed pontoons uh, on either side of the hull and they used uh, steam powered cranes and 12 large tugboats uh, in order to get her out of the mud. Ships can get reputations for being accident prone and who's going to buy a ticket uh, for an accident prone vessel? which may be why the following spring the Penobscot was renamed the Mohawk. However, it didn't prevent further accidents. Um, the ship uh, was lost uh, with all hands in 1915. So we have another uh, image of the Penobscot. It's a painting. This is uh, the Penobscot leaving 
a steamboat landing right here in Searsport in Penobscot Bay. So this is where our museum is. And you can see the wharf where the steamship would come and dock and where people would board and depart. And you can see the Penobscot right here in the center of this painting. Same uh, colorful side paddle wheel and that same walking beam, that big uh, part of the mechanism of the steamship. Uh, Interestingly, uh, part when they built the Penobscot, they had some lumber left over, and they used that to build a smaller steamship called the Rockland. Um, it was just 99 feet uh, and carried only 134 tons. And there are multiple ships named Rockland, which caused me some confusion when I was doing research for this. The first ship named Rockland was uh, built in 1854. It carried 400 tons. And that ship had some adventures in the Civil War. It was a transport and dispatch boat. It was captained by Otis Ingram. Um, at one point, um, Otis Ingram guided the Rockland along the James River under fire, 168 shots were fired at the Rockland, but Captain Ingram sailed through and they survived amazingly enough. Although later in the war, uh, Rockland was sunk in Charleston Harbor. Uh, but Captain Ingram sailed on for decades on many other ships. Um, and he actually wrote, continued to rise in the ranks and was uh, later in his life at the head of the um, steamship company. And uh, he was charged with bringing in the, the new Rockland uh, the, called the City of Rockland. This was uh, built in 1901 in East Boston, it was 274 feet and carried almost 1,700 tons. So it was a very big ship. Uh, Captain Ingram uh, sailed it up from uh, the launching up to Penobscot Bay. The Belfast Band greeted the vessel with music. Um, and we have a painting of it here. This is a watercolor. And it's very interesting, the differences in this later ship. It still has a walking beam engine. You can see the tip of it sticking up there. But they wanted to cover it up. They thought it was more aesthetic not to see those mechanical parts. So they built this uh, little deck that just covers up uh, the mechanics. And the paddle wheels also, they're still there, but you can't really see them and they're hidden. You can just sort of see it sticking out, splashing in the water here. Um, I find that interesting that they thought it was more attractive to have those mechanical parts covered up. You can see how large this ship is. It had 200 um, big uh, stateroom cabins and also an additional 200 regular cabins. And uh, some shadowy figures here on the decks. The city of Rockland went through uh, a number of uh, hardships. Uh, and only a few years after it was built in 1904, uh, they were trying to navigate through a thick summer fog and struck Southwest Ledge near Ash Island. So if you uh, got to see the map, let's go back to that. Um, there's a bunch of islands and ledges off of Thomaston. 
and uh, that's that's where the city of Rockland hit a ledge. It hit one ledge, then drifted and got stuck on another wreck, an old wreck of the city of Portland. And they had to figure out what to do with 400 passengers. Some of them were threatening to sue uh, for property loss, even though their, their ticket had a little statement saying uh, the company was not liable for over $100 of damaged belongings. Uh, the ship was raised in a major uh, uh, savage salvage effort. It took 25 boats and tugs to raise it back up above the water again. It was repaired, uh, but just two years later, had another accident. It ran into its sister ship, the city of Bangor, off of Portland. Uh, multiple accidents after that further damaged. Uh, the ship was finally uh, taken to Boston, declared irreparable, um, and was towed uh, towed over to Little Misery Island off the North Shore. Little Misery Island seems a very fitting name. <laughs> um, so soon after that, um, the people had been working on developing screw propellers, and that was the next big shift in ship technology. Screw propellers, uh, once they were perfected, became uh, the regular way of propelling a ship and to, to this day. So uh, screw propellers were, uh, had a number of advantages, but one of the main was, was maneuverability. You could have one pointing back and forth, you could have one on the starboard or right side, you could have one on the port left side, and that would let you, you know, turn and back and, and do all kinds of different things. So screw propellers turned out to uh, replace the, the big, huge uh, paddle wheels. Oh, one, one other little fun thing, that um, bit of the locking beam that you can see sticking up here. Um, after it was towed to Little Misery Island, it was burned, and those iron mechanical parts were still there, uh, rusting, sticking up above the water, and you could actually still see them uh, as late as the 1940s, just sticking up above the water off of Little Misery Island. I have one last fun image for you today. I'm so glad that you all found us and uh, we're Penobscot Marine Museum, uh, usually live on Facebook on Fridays at noon. This photograph fascinates me. This is also uh, the ship, the city of Rockland, in the back there. Um, and this is the wharf at Kidder Point. So that's right near us here, um, near Sears Island. And here are a whole bunch of passengers that are disembarking from the ship. And it's a great scene. It's, it's so bustly. You really um, capture the feel of all of these people coming off the ship and they're going and doing their things. Um, many people have packages. So they're all coming from Boston. And I wonder, some of them may have been people going down to Boston to do some shopping. But a lot of them are tourists coming up from Boston, coming up to see Maine for a little vacation. And this is a big difference. Uh, this photograph was taken by Harriet Pitchbourne. And she is showing these women here uh, pretty independent compared to uh, what their mothers may have experienced, for instance or what this woman experienced earlier in her life. In Victorian times, women were expected to stay home. They either stayed home and received friends at their house, or they could go to friends' houses 
and visit in their friends' homes, but they didn't go gallivanting about. And last week, if you joined us, um, you uh, may have heard about uh, the newspaper articles that were talking about women coming and visiting Maine and hiking around in the wilds and painting and sketching. And this was a brand new thing for women to be going out on their own and doing stuff. And I find that to be a very interesting piece of this whole uh, picture of these steamships, that there were these women having new opportunities. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I really appreciate you coming and finding out about steamships. We are so grateful to our members and our donors who made this possible. We're grateful to the National Endowment for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor. We'll be uh, here again one way or the other. We'll find a way. Um, next Friday at noon, we'll be talking about dangerous cargoes. So join us next week, Friday at noon. And thank you so much and take care.